So this is about creating genuine business communication. And our guest is Don Henwood. And I will um, tell you more about Don as we move through. But I'm really super delighted that she's here with us today. Um, to share her expertise. And I like to start off by sharing my favorite quote, um, which is communication is not saying something. Communication is being heard. And um, I'll share with you that Frances Hesselbein was the CEO of Girl Guides of America for many, many years. And then she started her own communications company. Uh, and she is still working at 103. She has won the Medal of Freedom, or been, not won it, been awarded the Medal of Freedom uh, in the US. Quite a fascinating woman. Okay, so I'm gonna start off by giving a definition, a general definition of genuine, because we're gonna get a, another one or more details from Dawn. So I went to the dictionary to be sure I was talking about the right thing. And it turns out that genuine comes to us from the Latin in about the 1590s. And it means natural, native, not acquired, right? And um, what it doesn't mean is that it's hypocrisy or pretense. So it's the absence of those things. That's what it means when we're being our genuine selves, when we're communicating from our true voice, so to speak. And sometimes that's a surprise that someone isn't being genuine, like isn't everyone being themselves? And the, the very quick answer there is no. <laughs> And especially when it comes to communication. And I wanted to give you a few examples to put that in perspective. Um, sometimes we will have a client or perhaps a superior, um, uh, a boss, and we, we find ourselves getting caught up in trying to communicate in a way they are expecting us to communicate as opposed to communicating from our true voice. And in my world, uh, where I have struggled with this in the extreme is when I'm responding to a, an RFP or a request for a proposal, or I might be filling out a form for a funding program. And I get all twisted up and nervous even, and anxious because I think there is there's something they want to hear and I have to give it to them in a way they're expecting. Um, so those are, are examples of when we can find ourselves not being genuine. So I wondered if there were ways um, for us to know if we're being disingenuous. And I gave that some thought and this is my own experience. I don't know if this is, these are things everybody experiences. You may have different experiences. And if you do, certainly include them in chat. We'd love to know what they are. But if I'm not writing from my voice, the writing takes a very long time. And uh, when I wrote my book and started that journey of writing a business book. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was so painful until I figured out, well, this is in my voice. That's why this is taking so long. I'm trying to write like, I don't know who, but this is me. Um, if I refer to a thesaurus frequently, I'm probably not writing from my genuine voice. I'm scrambling to find other language. When I thought about RFPs and funding applications, I realized that sometimes in those cases, I would refer to an example and then try to copy that example's tone. And when I do that, then everything falls apart, really. Um, if I'm frustrated while I'm doing the work, 
then that's an indication that it's I'm not in my I'm not using my voice because I have you know my background's English literature my I've been a journalist I read constantly so I I have that privilege of having a lot of words available to me all the time so if I get really frustrated with words then I'm probably not speaking from my genuine place and just in terms of of conversation if I'm having a really awkward conversation with somebody um, and I'm overthinking what I'm saying. And I have a person like this in my life right now, actually. Um, then I'm not being who I am. And I'm not sure why that's happening. I'm trying to figure it out now because I spent, this person comes into my life fairly often these days. And I'm not my genuine self. So all of our conversations don't have a rhythm to them. And I'm pre-thinking everything I'm saying. And I don't know why that's happening, but uh, a good example of my being disingenuous. So what's the value to us as business owners, salespeople, customer service people in our personal lives of striving to be genuine? Why is it important? Well, again, I'm going to talk from my own experience and then we're going to hear a lot from Dawn. But it does allow you to write and speak easily and freely. When we do a lot of self editing um, or self criticism, I guess even, of our words and our how we speak, uh, it really limits our ability to communicate clearly. Conversations flow. Conversations are my favorite thing. <laughs> well, okay, maybe chocolate and ice cream, but conversations that flow. Uh, Dawn and I um, had coffee, which is where this idea of doing this, this webinar together came from. And it was so lovely, Dawn, to sit across a table from you and just allow the conversation to happen. And it's like having this wonderful sun umbrella on a beautiful beach and you're just covered by conversation you're just sort of inside the conversation and when you're being genuine and for me genuine means we're laughing um then that's a, such a great place to be with anybody right and you don't have to think about things and there's no surprises so when you're being yourself and they are being themselves. That's the other part of it. Um, the unexpected doesn't happen as often. You don't get a startling piece of email from somebody who's completely misinterpreted something that you've said, right? And when there are challenges, and every relationship has challenges, they're um, dealt with respectfully. So that's, and they're accepted and dealt with respectfully. And the relationship is to a large extent reliable, which I think is something that's so important to all of us, particularly as we've gone through this very challenging time in human existence, that we have really paid attention to those relationships that we could truly rely on. And genuine communication is part of that. Um, and in work, well, and in friendship too, the client knows exactly who I am. So I know they're choosing to work with me. They're not choosing to work with some ideal that I've put forward that I can't deliver on. And that space has to be super stressful. If you haven't been yourself and then someone agrees to work with you and you have to somehow keep working with that pretense or at some point let that pretense go, I'm, I'm sure that's incredibly stressful. So I feel very blessed that I've been able to create a business where I'm who I am, you know. So what does my genuine communication look and sound like? And I'm giving this to you only as a sample, um, 
not of something you need to strive for because it's my genuine communication. But when it comes to um, email, there's always a lot of white space. There's numbers or bullets to move you through the email. Um, there's calls to action or steps for follow-up within the email. Mm -hmm. And there's always a bit of the personal. And that's about me. One of the things I've learned uh, from working with numerous uh, engineering firms across the country is that not everybody likes the bit of personal. And that's okay. You need to be true to, to you, not to me. And in conversations, I really strive to be welcoming and warm and open. Again, I like to include a bit of the personal. I think laughter is really important. It's important for me to, to for people to know that I can be funny. Um, but I also like to be precise. And certainly in a business environment, I really like to be precise. And I like to have a call to action and steps for follow-up. And in a proposal, I'm professional, but I'm colorful, which I think is also an indication of my being genuine. I'm not trying to be navy blue and white and black in a corporate setting. And again, I go back to being detailed and precise with numbers and bullets and calls to action and steps to follow up because I like a lot of clarity when it comes to, to communication. So if I write a rambling email, that's a good indication to me that I'm not being genuine. So let me introduce you a bit better to our guest, Dawn Henwood. So she really helps business people share information and ideas in simple and clear ways that resonates with their target market, but that is also true to themselves, right? And really helps them find and her, you know, forge is a great word, their genuine voice in their written work. And she has a PhD in English. She's written two books and she's delightful. <laughs> On top of all that, she's very warm and personable and lovely. So welcome Dawn, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you, Mary Jane. It is always a pleasure to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So how do you end up defining genuine communication? Yeah, in a lot of the same ways you do, uh, definitely in terms of transparency and authenticity. And I guess I would add that word connection, because I think there are kind of two parts to that phrase, you know, genuine communication. Uh, one is being genuine about who you are and your voice. And the other is about being genuinely interested in making communication happen. And as that great quote from Francis Hickelbein said, you know, it's not really all about you. It's about the understanding that develops and the, the interchange. So that to me is, um, that's what genuine communication is. It's, it's making that connection happen. And, you know, what's been, what's been your experience working with business people? Like, where, how is it that they don't know their genuine voice? Or where do they get caught that they're not able to find that genuine voice? Yeah, as you were talking about that and about the importance of being yourself in, in business and, you know, inserting, you know, humor and that kind of thing, I was reminded of myself as a very young professor. So I was the world's worst professor when I started out. <laughs> um, I need to send apology notes to everybody I taught between 1998 and 2002. I just need to do a mass email. Um, but I remember, you know, squeezing myself into shirts with collars and blazer and little, little skirts and heels um, because I was so anxious at 29 that, you know, and really worried that the students wouldn't take me seriously because I'm short, I'm only 5'2", and I, I looked very young at that point. Um, and it was really such an intense learning experience. Um, 
I thought I was being very accessible. I was pouring my heart into preparing my classes and giving my lectures. But what I didn't realize was that I was so nervous about trying to be this professor that I was actually lecturing like this. I don't know if you can see in the Zoom, but I was lecturing with my arms crossed. And I was doing things like looking at the ceiling. And so the students hated me. And they said I was unapproachable and I was inaccessible and all of these things. And it was because I was trying so hard to be somebody else. Uh, and so I had to learn as a teacher, I caught on and said, oh, this isn't actually my style. I'm more of a mentor. Um, that's why my new program coming out is messaging mentor. I'm more of a coach and so on. So I think the same thing happens with people in writing. As we try to be impressive, we try to pull out the business speak, the four syllable words, whatever we think, well, we have to sound this way. And that just creates barriers between us and uh, the person we're communicating with. I'm wondering if anybody on the call has experienced that where like a similar story to to yours in a way where you were trying to be somebody you weren't. Um, I did have a job like that myself in my mid 20s and uh, it, but I suffered because of it like and which which you did as well right? Yeah oh absolutely. Steve yeah. Suffered and I suffered everybody suffered. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so how, what's the process is you use them to, to help somebody who's struggling being their, their genuine selves? Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I do is often get people to read their writing aloud. Uh, because I say if it doesn't sound like something that you would actually say, then it's probably not going to come across as genuine. Um, I will often say to somebody, if they're writing an email or a report or a proposal, I will actually say, okay, let's just turn this mumbo jumbo over. We'll turn the page over. What would you say to me in a meeting? Or what would you say on the phone? And that often enables people to kind of step back and say, oh yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually put that that way at all. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you had a couple of great tips that you shared with us yesterday. One of them was about reading out loud. Yes. Yeah. Reading out loud. The other tip, um, I use a lot with people is free writing. So I don't know, I'd be curious to know whether anybody uh, online here today has experience with free writing, but free writing means you just write without stopping, usually for about um, 10 minutes to start. Uh, it's really hard for a lot of people to do. I've had people in workshops just say, I can't do this. I could never do this. And then at the end of 10 minutes, they're like, wow, I had no idea. I think I'm a writer now. <laughs> So that can be very freeing. And what it does is it gets you used to hearing your own voice. Um, I once taught a communications class, an oral communications class. I had an actor friend come in and one of the exercises he did is he had everybody in the class stand up and yell as loudly as they could. I thank goodness it was an evening class, there was nobody there. Um, and his point was that it can be quite terrifying to hear our own voice. And if people on the call are doing videos and they podcasts, they have some of that experience. But it's the same thing in writing. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's a really useful exercise. Just get used to hearing yourself in print. Yeah. And one of the other things when we read out loud, whether it's an email or, um, you know, if you're, if you're playing with scripting for a phone call or a speech, um, you'll hear if there's a, how awkward it might be. Yes. So yes. I had a, a young woman that was working with me and she, she didn't have a lot of experience with writing and, and I wanted her to, to start writing some blog material. And one of the things I said to her is that writing has a flow much like music. So it's when you read it out loud, it, there aren't these sudden stop signs. Like it, it does all go together. Is that a fair thing to say? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's where, that's how poetry happens. And it's interesting because 
um, you know, I started out as a professor of 19th century literature. <laughs> you know, how do I end up, and a lot of the folks I work with now are, you know, scientists, engineers, and so on, so how does that path work? But what that background actually did, it enabled me to really work with language from the inside out, um, nice. because it's often these very, very small changes that we can make that make the difference between it sounding stuffy and it just sounding regular. And I love your comment, Linda, 19th century writing is hard to read now. I think I come across a lot of 19th century writing quite regularly. <laughs> really <laughs> long sentences. Henry James said the novel was like a loose baggy monster that describes a lot of proposals that I see. So um, genuine written communication, like I would say professional communication in the interpersonal sense, does involve some self-editing because you are thinking of the other person. So genuine written communication isn't just about babbling, right? It's conversational, but you're also, again, because you're genuinely wanting to connect with the other person, you're thinking about what works for them, what will make it readable, and, and so on. So Sorry about that. That happened yesterday, too. Um, <laughs> So how, what, you, you do the free writing and you get them to read out loud. And um, what has been your experience, some, some of those light bulb moments that people have gone through with you? Yeah, um, I think very often uh, what people experience is, um, this really uh, freeing sense and a sense of confidence. So I work with people as a consultant and a coach, but also sometimes I just will write for them, but it's still a very collaborative process. I always say my job is not to give you the words, it's just to find the words that are there and help them come out. So it's a, it's a lot of confidence that happens uh, and things become easier as you pointed out, you know, when, when you're not communicating in an authentic way, it's much, it's much harder. Um, I had that experience when I taught in Nigeria um, back in uh, 2010. And it was so interesting to me because it's a phenomenon I've seen actually in many different contexts, but it was almost like the people in the room had a completely different personality when they were in print. Um, they spoke to me uh, very uh, conversationally, colloquially. They had traveled the world, most of these uh, people. They'd been to far more countries than I have been to. And yet when they started to write, I could tell that they had learned English writing from colonial textbooks uh, oh. from the 50s. And so really like different, completely different personality. I'd hold the page up and say, is this, is this the same person? Um, and what was really amazing when, when we started to work on genuine voice, um, a lot of issues that they were having with grammar and punctuation as English language learners, about two thirds of those just evaporated. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, yeah. That's huge. Um, I think it would be the same for the French language, Judith is asking. Writing is, all, is very and always formal, yet conversations are not. Yeah, and I guess the, the difference between kind of um, French and English to some extent has to do with conventions. So um, my French degree is pretty rusty, rusty so don't forgive me if I'm off topic, but I think for instance in uh, in a letter in French, the, the closing, as I recall, is, is very, very complicated, like uh, je vous prie d'accrier à mes sentiments les plus agréables, or something like that. Do I have that right, Judith? <laughs> you know? Right? So, and it, that is still a convention today. So because it's a convention, it actually still, it still seems um, not natural, but it's expected. It's like it's like it's yes. part of thing. So just like if um, if I go to a meeting, I'm dressed up a little bit more than if I'm just playing in, in the yard with my dog. Right. right? So, so Amy's wondering, Amy's wondering if you can say that French slower. Oh, I think we should. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try again. Uh, 
Je vous prie d'accréer à mes sentiments les plus distingués ou les plus agréables. Yeah? So I, I beg of you to accept my most distinguished sentiments. So it's interesting, I'll add a quick story to that. When I uh, teach my phone skills in, uh, in Quebec, um, you know that I, for most, some of you on the phone, you've been through my teaching. And, and so I, I say, well, you can't, you shouldn't start a call with someone you've never spoken to with, how are you? But in Quebec, you must. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a convention that you would be that formal. You wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to you if you dropped that formality. So um, just a, as you say, it's, it's just something that's there. What I want to find out, um, is how people work with you. I, now I do know, or I think I know, you are, yes, same with Newfies, Amy, that's right. I, I, it has to be said in Newfoundland as well. You're absolutely right. Um, you have a course coming up, I think, but there are other ways people can reach, reach yeah. you and work with you. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I'm just doing a, a pilot version this summer of a new course called Messaging Mentor, which is a coaching-based program. And over the course of the program, uh, people will actually produce three pieces of real marketing collateral, um, like a white wow. paper or blog post or um, it could be web copy and they'll get real feedback from me uh, during the program. So that's something that's coming out. Um, I do training sessions for groups and I do one-on-one -on -one or small group coaching. Sometimes I work with teams and the team uh, writing process is something that we can work on together to become more efficient. And then I do um, authoring. So writing everything from white papers and eBooks to- Oh, great. So there's lots of ways that you can work with Dawn and she's easy to find, right? It's dawnhenwood.com. Yeah. And I, you know, I was really interested by the comment earlier that somebody had made about, you know, as a consultant going from company to company and how they expect you to fit in with their culture. And I would say that that is definitely something that um, anybody who's a service provider, yes, that's something we do. And as you become more confident and competent as a writer, you will find that you can actually take on different voices while still being yourself. Ah, I wish we'd gotten to that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do another webinar, John, because that's fascinating. And I know that to be true, but I think I know it to be true instinctively as opposed to, I couldn't give an example, but I know that I do do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it would be, I think that would be interesting to explore actually. Yeah. Exactly. Um, if you've got questions for Dawn, please uh, put them into, into chat because we'll stay on the call a little longer if there are questions to answer. So remember dawnhenwood.com and um, because you're here with us today, you are going to uh, get a copy of this um, slide deck and any notices of special discounts or anything that the phone lady is doing. And also, um, many of you are already on my weekly blog list, but if you're not, you are now. <laughs> And we do have a webinar lined up for August on the 11th and 12th. And we had a lot of feedback when Linda Daly was our special guest. So she's coming back in August to talk about the intersection of sales and marketing. And we're totally excited about doing that together. And um, hope that everybody on the call can join us. And a quick word about something that I'm involved in at the moment called My Revenue Room. And it's an online community as opposed to a course that I'm part of with two colleagues from Newfoundland. And it really is aimed at small business owners and freelancers and independent consultants who are struggling to create consistent, sustainable revenue. So that's what the community is about. And we've been, we launched it in April. We thought we were gonna launch in September, but we launched it early because of COVID. And we are 
uh, 34 members, I believe now. And um, it's kind of crazy good. Um, much to my surprise, like people are really um, making money uh, based on the conversations that are happening and the tips they're picking up, not just from me and, and Chris and Carol, but from everybody in the community, which is pretty powerful. So right now for the summer, instead of um, having sales webinars, if you're interested in learning more, send me an email because I'm going to then invite you as a guest to one of our actual events within the community. So on the 14th, um, there's a time with Carol. Carol is our uh, professor. She's the money person, the logical person, and she does great presentations on, and discussions on how to make money. And then uh, July 30th, I think the invitation is to come to the book club in July, which is on Eat That Frog. Um, so you'd be able to see how that works within the community. So get in touch with me if that holds interest for you, and I'll make sure that you um, get an invitation to attend. Any other questions or comments from anybody at all? Thanks for all the points in chat and Jeanette thanks for letting me know that I had a noisy keyboard question for Dawn I have a good vocabulary and use it naturally but sometimes I edit and change words to be simpler maybe I should stop and be natural aha uh -huh. um, so that's the balance between um, being yourself and being genuinely interested in creating a connection with the other person Ooh. I can relate to that. I always say I am a recovering academic. So yes, my natural style is polysyllabic, <laughs> right? Um, but um, I, if I am thinking of the other person and I'm more interested in connecting with them than I am in living in my own head, then I edit myself and I have found kind of another style. If I'm talking to a professor, I can talk that way, but I can be my genuine self and, and talk in a simpler way too. I find myself in writing, I can catch those, those words. Yeah. Um, but I've certainly stood in front of a lot of groups and used a word <laughs> and then noticed that they're all kind of looking at me like, what is she talking about? And for whatever reason, right? Being a big reader, um, there are words I use and I later realized they had no idea what that word was. So I think it happens to all of us. And Amy's got a question here. Um, it's a bit off topic, she says, but how do you tackle imposter syndrome, Dawn? Mm-hmm. That's a good one. I would say if free writing helps a lot with that. I think also um, looking for pieces of writing that you admire and actually copying them, not in a way that makes you feel constrained, but actually uh, in a way that um, I guess enables you to see, oh, somebody else who is successful doing what they do um, actually uses a style like this. And so actually try and say, oh, could I take that on? Could I try that out and take that for a run? And, see, and actually for, for centuries, that has been a way that people have taught writing uh, effectively. I love that. Yeah, finding a role model, I guess. Years and years ago, I, um, I wanted to write a mystery novel. Ah. And I decided to base it on another mystery novel. And I actually counted all the words in, in the chapters and the length of the chapters and the pace of the chapters and, and allowed myself to write the first book based on that blueprint. It's not published or anything, but it got written. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So that's an interesting, I hadn't thought of that. That's pretty good. Well, for me, this is really an issue with copywriting uh, yeah. because so much of the advice you'll see out there about copywriting is very hard headed and you know can tend towards coercion more than persuasion. Um, and so I look around at people like you, Mary Jane, you know, I love your blog. If you don't have Mary Jane's email, you should. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Um, Mark Silver, 
who runs something called Heart Centered Business. I've learned a lot from him. So that has really given me confidence to find my own voice uh, in some of the copy that I produce for, for Don Henwood. Yeah, great. And how do you tackle the ums and ahs in conversation, a lot of it comes from my nerves. So, Amy, one of the things I say to that is we all um and awe. Ah, and if we don't, it can come across like we're too rehearsed. So I actually insert ums and ahs into my conversation so that I don't sound too polished. I sound real what are you what's your reaction Dawn well I'm thinking that um, I've worked with uh, some big consulting firms and they give courses on executive presence and one of the things that they teach executives is that there is um, power in silence and that it is actually okay to just say I'll need a second to think about that or even just to say hmm and pause for a minute before you speak. Is that too? Okay, great. Um, Amy, Jeanette's added that um, that might be a whole webinar on its own to avoid ums and ahs. <laughs> so we'll definitely give that some thought. Thanks everybody for all the activity in chat. Yeah. So appreciate it. And also for coming today. And Dawn, thank you to you. Oh, thank you so for, much for being here. So awesome. And uh, we'll see everybody again soon. Enjoy the rest of your week. Okay. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.